Hello and welcome Breakthrough Success listeners. I'm your host, Mark Guberti, and this is the podcast where you'll learn how to achieve the breakthroughs you've been looking for in your business and life. If you want to grow your content brand, you'll definitely want to add my latest book, Content Marketing Secrets, to your reading list. This book will teach you how to create, promote, and optimize your content for growth and revenue. You can get your copy at Mark Guberti, that is Mark with a C, so markguberti.com slash book. And now, let's dive right into the show. For episode 74 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast, we are going to talk about creating massive engagement for our content with our guest, Tim Fargo. Tim is an American author, keynote speaker, angel investor, and entrepreneur. In 2015, Tim launched the startup Tweet Jukebox, which is now known as Social Jukebox, an app and service acclaimed by the likes of Forbes and Social Media Examiner. Social Jukebox assists business owners with scheduling social media posts in a time-effective manner. That is the app created by Tim. Let's get to know the man himself. Tim, welcome to the show. Mark, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Tim, it is such a pleasure to have you on the Breakthrough Success Podcast, and I really look forward to diving into creating that massive engagement for our content. But before we do that, I'd love to get some background. So what got you started with social media and content marketing? Um, geez, you know, I, I sold um, another business in 2003 um, that I'd run for seven years, and that was a pretty nice exit. So um, I was just sort of doing project based stuff. And then I got the idea that I wanted a little bit more of like outside engagement. So, um, book and self published it. And I quickly found out what a lot of self published authors found out that, uh, nobody cares that you wrote a book. <laughs> um, so I went to social media to try to promote the book. And in the process of doing that kind of discovered how arduous it is to keep populating evergreen content out there in an effort to sort of just keep your, you know, content in front of someone, keep your face in front of people, um, and that sort of thing. And so, and I travel a lot. So we were on the road and I was yet again, like trying to go through my reams and reams or, you know, spreadsheets of, of quotes and things like that and blog posts that I was going to post. And I finally got frustrated and I contacted the former head of IT for the company I'd sold. Um, and in the beginning, I just wanted a tool for me to automate my content. Uh, you know, I wanted to automate my content delivery um, to social media. And so I didn't really, I mean, there was no, from the onset, I mean, there was no end game in mind. It was just, you know, I, I, I need something. And, you know, um, the things I looked at didn't do what I wanted them to do. So, um, we built something and then people <laughs> seems a lot more interested in the tool than my book. So, um, you know, to me, like kind of a great rule of entrepreneurship is, you know, go, go, go where, you know, you're being kind of led by, you know, your clients or potential clients. Um, and there was clearly much more of an interest in a demand for the software. So we created, um, a little bit more palatable, um, interface for the thing. Cause when it was first built, it was horrific. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was for me, right. It was like, you know, I knew what, what to click on to get it to do what I wanted. So I didn't care about the UI. Um, so we built a free version and, um, we let people sign up and you know, we got a thousand people and then we got 2000 people and then we got 5,000 people and we got 10,000 people. So then the question was, well, that's awesome. You know, I'm really glad that people like it, but um, will people pay for this? And, um, so we put up a payment gateway, um, after a little over a year. And, um, I think like initially we got a little over 500 people, um, to sign up for as paid customers and that's steadily grown, um, until today. And, you know, so anyhow, that's, that's the nature of how we got to where, um, to where we are. I mean, it was, it was, completely an accident, but the opportunity sort of presented itself and, you know, it was pretty obvious there was, there was something there. So, you know, that would, that instantly got my attention. Tim, thank you for sharing with us the backstory of what got you started with social media and content marketing. And part of 
uh, successful content marketing is to create content that is going to resonate very well with our audiences. So how do you recommend that we determine what content will resonate with our audiences for maximum engagement? Well, I mean, okay. I think the most important thing is to get to know your audience. Um, and you know, very often the easiest thing to do is ask, um, you know, or, or get into a dialogue with people and you start seeing like what questions remain unanswered, um, in their mind and things like that. And so content <clears throat> though is going to take a few different forms, right? I mean, you know, if you think about the old media model of like a TV station, I mean, you know, the content was largely entertainment. Um, I mean, there are other things like news that they sold ads around and stuff like that. Cause I mean, essentially what we're all trying to do is gather eyeballs and trust. Um, so, you know, the ultimate content drives engagement with your audience and, and creates trust. I mean, you could, you could post like the most outrageous content in the world, um, that would certainly get attention, but it might not get you trust. So you kind of need to be able to land those two, which is why for people like me, for instance, I mean, you know, because I'm in sort of the social media business now, you know, writing content and doing things that help inform people about how to conduct their content marketing is better than me, you know, like writing an article about how to train your dog. I mean, there might be people interested in that, but I'm just straying away from, you know, kind of my core audience. So, um, I think that's, you know, the real trick though, um, as I said in the beginning, I think you really need to know your audience because when you know your audience, you'll be able to deliver to them the things that they're after and you won't be just recycling, um, you know, kind of the same old tired posts and things like that, that, you know, they've, they've got access to a zillion of, you know, written by other people. Um, you know, it's good to try to cut some fresh ground. Tim, thank you for sharing some insights on how we can determine the content that will resonate with our audiences. And once we get people onto the con uh, on the uh, like consuming our content, which we'll talk about later, attracting those visitors. Uh, part of uh, growing your audience is optimizing your content so that it's easier for people to engage with and share. So. How do we craft our content in such a way that it's easier and more enticing for people to share it with their audiences? Well, I mean, for one, I think, you know, whether you're using a tool like um, Noah Kagan's um, Sumo, um, you know, on your blog, I mean, it depends on where you're posting your content. I mean, if you're talking about long form kind of blog content, I mean, you might be posting it on your own blog. Um there's a lot to be said for posting it in places where people are actively looking for content like medium, for instance. Um, because if you're, I mean, these, these are questions that like have huge potential answers, but I think the short version is, you know, you need to have like, there need to needs to be shareable functions on whatever platform. So if it's your own blog, you need to have a tool like sumo that allows you you know, your users, your followers, whatever, to easily share that content. Or alternatively, you're posting someplace like Medium where there are already people looking for textual um, based content to read. Um, so you can post there and then those tools, those sharing tools are already built in. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of a built in audience, which makes it slightly easier from the beginning um, to get in front of people. But Whatever, wherever you're putting your content, you want to make sure that um, there's easy access to share buttons and things like that. Because if 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 you're counting on people, to, unless your stuff is awesome, um, counting on people to like copy a link and send it to a friend is, I mean, it's a it seems like a simple bridge, but it's not. If people people today want to click on buttons. I definitely agree that, I mean, it's it seems so simple just to copy a link and paste it and send it to a friend, but we, we, this is a very fast-moving world, so we don't have time to do some of the simpler, easier things like that. It's something that is easy to do, it's just as easy not to do. So we were talking about putting our content in front of our audiences and in front of more people, but how do we make sure that we're attracting the right people to our content, the targeted people who are going to subscribe, buy, and do things like that. 
I honestly don't think I'd be that worried about that. Um, I mean, I think you need to know the audience you're after. I mean, I think every business has their own kind of avatar, the person they're targeting. Um, but, but somebody who, you know, maybe is reading your content today is broke, um, you know, it doesn't have any means to consume anything you're producing, right? So on paper, you know, if you're strictly analyzing today's um, potential of that client, the potential zero, but how long are you in the game for? Are you in the game for a quick hit? Or are you trying to build relationships? Because if you build relationships, that's going to be much more meaningful and, and be a much longer lasting income stream. Um, when people view you as a reliable source of content, they might say, you know, when I was in school, I was interested in doing what you do. Um, and I read your stuff and I always wanted to buy something, but I never had the money. You know, but you might be talking about a two or three year horizon. So I think the idea of worrying about that kind of tight of a filter, at least in my view, um, is probably unnecessary. I mean, I think what you want to do is you want to draw people in because, you know, and even if the person that you've drawn in doesn't want your content, maybe they're going to share it with their buddy who's already working and, you know, and is interested. So you don't really know where the next piece of business is, especially when you're getting started. I think it's greater, it's better to keep an open mind as to who might be the next person in front of you. And I really love the idea of keeping an open mind because some people, they like narrow down on who their audience is. And it's good to have an avatar of who your audience is, but you don't want to be so focused on one avatar that you close your mind to all the other avatars available to you who would also want to engage with your content. And when you do get people to engage with your content, read, watch, listen, consume, um, part of... uh, building a better relationship is getting people to stick around for a longer period of time. So how can we get people to stick around and consume more of our content? I think ultimately, you know, I mean, right now it's easier than ever to create content. So there's more people doing it than ever, but the, but most people are doing a fairly bad job of it. I would say, cause they, they focus more on, like kind of cheap tricks, I would say, you know, I mean, like clickbait and things like that. So, I mean, what you're doing in any, any long lasting relationship, you're building trust. And I mean, that's the whole key. Like when I talked about the book, right. And which actually is a great little segue of, you know, I mean, keeping an open mind. I mean, I originally wanted to sell books. Now I'm selling software. So yeah, keep an open mind. But, um, you know, back on this idea of trust, like with regard to reading someone's book, I mean, these days there's a lot out there to read and to pay attention. I mean, there's YouTube clips, there's Instagram, there's snap, you know, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's LinkedIn. I mean, there's a million places to consume things, right? So you've got to give that person a compelling reason to read your stuff. And that reason is going to be that the first time they read something by you, they felt like it was authentic and it was helpful and, you know, and they view you as someone who is going to write something that's worth reading. So when they see a new article by you, they're going to want to read it because it's not just like a fluff piece. Um, and I think, you know, that's the critical thing. It's don't, don't fall in love with the idea of just ringing a bell really loud to get their attention. I mean, that's kind of the cheap trick. I mean, you're going to need to engage in a certain level of noise making to get them to come to you the first time, but make sure when they arrive that you've got something worth their attention because otherwise you risk not seeing them again. Tim, thank you for sharing those insights onto how we can get people to stick around once the initial connection has been made and to build that relationship even further and as people want to create their really successful content brands whether it's through blogging video podcasts or any other form of content uh, there are certain things that hold people back from achieving their level of success so i'm wondering based on your experience uh, in your journey and seeing others in their journeys what do you believe holds most people back from reaching their full potential with using content to expand their brands I'd say most people give up too soon. Um, and they don't, 
and they don't i think they give up too soon and or they don't analyze what's going wrong you know in terms of like i've been doing a video quote for about a half a year now every day i put out a new like me doing a video usually about 60 seconds and i pin it on my twitter page um and I just started doing it as like something new. And it's getting good engagement, but it's not great. So now I'm having a debate with myself about like what's – how do I take this thing to the next level? And I think this gets to the question you're asking and that is you know, you go out and you, know, you try something. And most of the time it's not just – it's really not a complete failure. It might feel like it. But you'll have like some minute traction of some sort if you're trying. But then it's to ask yourself, like, okay, well, how do I up the ante? How do I make this better? Um, so I think, you know, the, t- the kind of the twin towers of perseverance and improvement, um, you know, if you keep trying and you keep trying to get better, um, those two things working in concert will usually le- yield a very good result. But that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the work. I mean, you know, sometimes people think perseverance is just staying in – you know, staying in the game. And I think that's hugely important. But if you're staying in the game and you're not modifying your approach, well, you know, you may just be, you know, kind of beating <laughs> your hammer against, you know, the ground, um, which might be interesting to watch, you know, like a short video of. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's important to remember that, you know, there's what you're doing and then there's, you know, how do you take it to the next level? Like, I mean, take someone like Casey Neistat on YouTube who just blew it up, right? Now, the guy's a very skilled um, kind of, you know, movie maker or video maker. And that's the key. I mean, there's a lot of people putting out content, but he's putting out content that's really compelling. So there's a way to do it. And you don't necessarily have to cop. I don't copy him and I wouldn't necessarily suggest copying other people I think you have to craft your own style but again you go out and you go to market with whatever content you have and then you see what engagement you have and then you know you need to have people around you including the people you're delivering the content to give you feedback so that you know how to improve it because again I think perseverance and improvement are the like the twin towers of of making it Tim thank you for sharing with us uh what do you believe most people are held back by that prevents them from reaching their full potential and giving us a way to realize that full potential. And throughout anyone's journey, challenges are just an inevitable part. Uh, When I ask people this question, uh, many people start by saying that uh, I've had many challenges, but then they point out the one that I want but not to hear. So um, what is one big challenge that you have faced in your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge? Probably one of the biggest things um, is when I started the prior business, um, which was a um, an insurance investigation firm. Um, I mean, and just keep in mind at the time I had no like like almost everyone starting a business. I didn't. Ha- I had very little money. Just had an idea. I'm trying to charge ahead, whatever. And I'd been in business with some other people before, um, and just as a way of trying to throw me off my game, they sued me. And that was within three months of starting. They actually served me the lawsuit at a Christmas party. Um, And, you know, these guys had some money, plus one of them was a lawyer, so he could basically bury me with paperwork. Um, And, you know, and the idea here was to get me to basically exit the business and not compete with them because I didn't have any agreement or anything. Um, So... We had to, you know, really rally forces and stuff and go out and, like, you know, like get this thing taken care of. So the two things that I learned from that challenge, um, the first was, you know, don't let it – don't let a challenge freak you out. Because, I mean, as you said, it's inevitable. And that's certainly not the only one I've had. I mean, there's like a zillion of them. But, I mean, that was a pretty notable one. And you just – it like all problems have a solution, right? But – you've got to be willing to kind of sit down and figure it out. And the second piece was once I found a solution, um, realizing in, in this particular instance that the solution to this was finding a great lawyer, um, which cost me a fair whack of money. Um, but it was more important to me 
to win and prevail than to worry about, you know, the bills and, um, and all that. And then, you know, and buried in that is once I hired him, I let him do his job. I didn't get like, I didn't overreach on the challenge. Like a lot of people would go, they sued you, sue them back. Yeah. Well, you know, that's maybe great in a TV show or something, but I'm, I mean, I was in business to run my business. I was in business to do insurance investigations, not to file a lawsuit against my former partners. You know, if they wanted that distraction, that's fine. But, you know, it was easier for me to hire that person and let them have it. So I think the two things are, you know, sit down and, and look at the challenge. Don't let it kind of like daunt you. Um, and then the, um, you know, the second piece of that is, is when you, when you find a solution, let it, let it kind of take hold and run itself. Don't, um, because I, I guess, you know, when you're running a business, I'm trying to figure out a way to articulate this well, but, um, I think you can let something like that particular kind of challenge be, be redefine what you're doing. Um, and if you do that, that that's more of a risk to your business than the lawsuit itself, because you'd be taking your eye off the ball. So you need to make sure that, you know, is that challenge really an existential threat? Um, and, you know, to the extent you can have someone else like take care of it so you can focus on the things you need to do. Tim, thank you for sharing with us that big challenge and the powerful lesson you learned during that challenge. And another question that I love asking as Breakthrough Success listeners know, I'm a really big bookworm. So I love asking all guests for uh, three great books that would have a big impact on Breakthrough Success listeners. Wow, three great books. Um, I think Influence by Cialdini um, is an awesome marketing text um, in terms of identifying how people actually make decisions about buying stuff. Um, and I mean, that book, it, and it's for me, Influence in particular is a book. Don't read it and put it away somewhere. I mean, buy the paper version and, and plan on using it as a reference tool. Um, because even though those methods are much better known to maybe the public in general now, they still work. You know, social proof and rule of reciprocity and all those other things that are in there. Um, another book that I really loved um, was a book called Jungle Rules by a guy named John in Imlay. And I don't even know if that book is still in print, but it's the story of a turnaround that he did. And what I love about that book is it's not – so many business books you read make it sound like the person got on some magic surfboard and just kind of was transported. Um, and this book is not like that. This book shows the ugliness of having to terminate people and like get down into the nuts and bolts and the grit of making a business function. And if, if you can get your head around how they turn something around, I mean, there's a lot of information in there that's great. Like some people might go, well, but I, I'm trying to run a business, not turn one around. The lessons are like totally applicable to anyone. Um, so Jungle Rules by um, John Imlay is another great book. Um, and I'm going to draw a bit of a blank here because I'm trying to remember the name. I guess I could look it up while I'm talking to you. But I would say Learning Anything – by Edward Deming or Edwards Deming, um, who's the guy who taught the Japanese quality after World War II. I mean, the whole the whole essence of Deming is process. Um, and anybody who's starting a business ultimately is going to be faced with the need to understand process. Maybe not in the beginning when it's just you or just you and a couple like, you know, you know, when you've got a small group of people, but if you plan on scaling that business and it doesn't matter if it's technology or service or whatever, you're going to need to understand that replicatable process is what drives great execution. And there's no greater person to teach that than Edward Stemming. Tim, thank you for offering those three great book recommendations to Breakthrough Success listeners. And before we get to the part where um, I invite you to share with us where we can find you on the web. 
I've asked you a bunch of questions throughout this interview, and I'm wondering what is one question that you believe we need to be asking ourselves more often? I, th I think, you know, continue, continuing to ask yourself the problem you're solving is a really important question. Um, and a, gr a great illustration of that um, is, you know, the blockbuster versus Netflix issue. Um, where, you know, Blockbuster, um, you know, for maybe some of your older listeners and, and maybe some, maybe some of them know it anyway, but I mean, it was, a, you know, this was a, a video store that was everywhere, you know, and people would go out and rent their tapes and everything. And I mean, these guys were dominant and, and they had the name. I mean, everybody knew Blockbuster, you know, and when online video started to emerge, these guys just, it just they couldn't have it on their radar that, I mean, they were providing people with access to content, right? They were, you know, like entertaining content. And so Netflix comes along and they're delivering it online. And for whatever reason, these guys think that, you know, this is going to have no impact on the retail market. Well, they're out of business now. So I think, you know, if they backed up enough and gone, you know what, these guys are in the same exact business and, you know, and they're going to, they're going to succeed because it's easier to click, you know, on a button on a phone or a button on a screen and, you know, make, make the video happen than, you know, get in your car and, and driving over to a location. I mean, most people aren't going to do that if they can sit in the comfort of their own home and just like take care of it. So by focusing in on, or asking yourself, um, you know, what business are you really in? I, I think that is, you know, it's a it's a very very critical question. Um, and by doing that, you avoid waking up one day and realizing that, you know, your customers have all, you know, gone to do what they wanted to to consume the same thing in a better way from a competitor. Tim, thank you for providing us with that question that we should be constantly asking ourselves as we try to continue to solve problems and also wondering what problems we are trying to solve. And thank you for providing all the great insights throughout this episode. And before we close this episode out, for all the listeners wondering, where can we find you on the web? Well... I would love for everyone to go to socialjukebox.com and have a look at our product. Um, it's a great way to automate your content delivery so that you can free yourself up to run your business and to the extent you need to um, create or curate more content, it'll give you time to do that so you're not occupying yourself with scheduling it and things like that. Um, and you can reach me specifically at tim at socialjukebox.com. Um, any questions, whether it's about the software or just something we talked about or another question, I'm always happy to try to answer it in any event. Um, and on Twitter, which is kind of my um, preferred hangout, so to speak, on social media, my handle is at Tim underscore Fargo, F-A-R-G-O, like the bank. All right, Breakthrough Success listeners, you can get those links and all the show notes at markgaberry.com slash E74. Tim, it was such a pleasure to have you on the Breakthrough Success podcast. Mark, it was awesome. Thanks so much for having me. To never miss an episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on whatever player you are using. If you are a regular listener and haven't done so already, I would greatly appreciate it if you could give this podcast a review or a rating. Two ways you could do this are through markgaberti.com slash iTunes or markgaberti.com slash Stitcher. That ends this episode. Don't forget, dream big, achieve greatness, and unlock your potential today. Want your tweets to get retweeted to my 360,000 Twitter followers? All you have to do is say something nice about the Breakthrough Success Podcast and include the link markgaberti.com slash iTunes. Once you've posted that tweet, Email me, mark at markdeberry.com, and I will retweet your tweet to my 360,000 followers. This podcast is a production done by Mark Duberty. For more insights, head on over to markdeberry.com.